Welcome to the video help with physics problems for Physics 1A. In this video we'll be covering homework set 5, part 1. That's everything under the heading, heat and the first law of thermodynamics. For 1121 students this is questions 1 and 2. For 1131 students it's questions 1 to 3. Problem 1. In this problem we have a container made of copper its mass is equal to 146 grams it contains water with a mass of 223 grams and both the copper and the water are initially at 21.0 degrees C Then a lump of hot copper with a mass of 314 grams is added. So it's put in here. After it's added, we have 4.70 grams of steam produced. And this entire system is at 100 degrees C. It has to be at 100 degrees C to be in equilibrium with the steam. Part A asks us how much heat was transferred to the water. Well, the heat transferred to the water does two things. First of all, it heats up the water from 21 degrees to 100 degrees. So we can write that that amount of heat is equal to the mass of water times the heat capacity of water times the change in temperature of the water. And then we have some heat which goes into converting this water to steam. So the amount of heat that's needed to do that is equal to the mass of steam produced times the latent heat of vaporization of the water. So now we can substitute everything in. The mass of water is 0 0.223 kilograms. The heat capacity of water we're told is 4,200 joules per kelvin per kilogram and the change in temperature is the final temperature minus the initial temperature. We can put those both in degrees C. And then we've got the mass of steam produced which is 4.70 grams 10 to the minus 3 or put it into kilograms times the latent heat of vaporization of water which is 2.26 times 10 to the 6. Now we need to solve this on the calculator. When we do that, we get 84,600, which is equal to 84.6 kilojoules. So that's the amount of heat that's added to the water. Part B asks us how much heat has been added to this bowl. So to do that, the bowl is not changing state. It's only got this first term. So it's the mass of copper times the heat capacity of the copper times the change in temperature. Now it's only the bowl we're considering, not this copper rod. So the mass in the bowl is 0 0.146 kilograms. The heat capacity of copper is 387. And the change in temperature is 100 minus 21. We can solve that on the calculator and when we do that we get 4,000 460 so that's 4.46 kilojoules of heat needs to be added. So the heat which is added to the water and the copper would be the addition of these two. Part C says what is the original temperature of the cylinder? Well the energy added to the water plus the bowl is equal to the energy lost by copper rod. And we've got a negative sign here because this is going to be negative as it's a lost energy. So the energy isn't coming from anywhere else, it's only coming from the copper. Okay, so energy added to the water plus the bowl, that's 84.6 plus 4.46 times a thousand to get it into joules 
is equal to the energy lost by the copper rod. Now the copper rod's not changing state, it's just losing heat thermally. So that's mass of copper times the heat capacity of copper times the final temperature minus the initial temperature. This is what we're trying to find. The final temperature of the rod, finally it's in equilibrium with everything around it, so it's at 100 degrees C. So this is equal to, so 314 gram rod, so 314, times the heat capacity of copper, which we're told is 387, times the final temperature, which is 100, minus the initial temperature. And this will be in degrees C, as this is in degrees C. When we solve this on the calculator, we end up with 100 minus the initial temperature is equal to 733. And so the initial temperature is equal to, sorry, we forgot that negative sign. There's a negative sign there and a negative sign there. So the initial temperature is equal to 100 plus 733, which is equal to 833 degrees Celsius. Problem two. In this problem, we have T, which we've got 0 0.520 kilograms of T, 520 grams of it, and we're adding ice to it. We also have 520 grams of ice, so 0 0.520 grams of ice. We're asked when we add this ice into this tea, what's the final temperature? And is there any ice left? And how much? We're given two scenarios. In scenario A, the tea is at 90 degrees C. In scenario B, it's at 70 degrees C. Well, there's quite a few different ways to go about doing this problem. Let's first of all just consider how much energy we need to melt the ice. And then we can work out in both these scenarios if enough energy is present to melt it. Okay, so the energy needed to melt the ice is equal to the mass of ice times the latent heat of fusion for the ice and so that's 0 0.520 times 3.33 times 10 to the 5 which is equal to 173,160 joules which is equal to 173 kilojoules so that's how much energy we need to melt the ice now let's work out in each of these scenarios if this T did go all the way down to zero degrees C, how much heat would that release? So energy as T goes to zero degrees C. And so the energy released is equal to M, the mass of the T, times the heat capacity of the T, which is the same as the heat capacity of water, times the change in temperature. Okay, so for A, that's equal to 0 0.520 times 4180 times 90 and that is equal to 195,625 which is 196 kilojoules for B it's equal to 0 0.520 times 4180 times 70 which gives us 152 1,152 joules, which is equal to 152 kilojoules. Okay, so in scenario A, we have more than enough energy release, which implies that the T will not reach 0 degrees C. And in B, we do not have enough energy present so that suggests that not all the ice will be melted. Okay so now we need to look at each of these individually and work out okay well what is the final temperature then. For part A we've said 
t will not reach zero degrees c. Okay, but we're now we're looking at what it will reach. So we know that the heat gained by ice is equal to the negative of the heat lost by the T. So the heat gained by the ice goes into two things. First of all, it must change the state of the ice and then it must raise the temperature of the ice to the final temperature, which will be above zero degrees. So this is given by the mass of the ice times the heat capacity of the water times Tf minus Ti. And if we do this in degrees C, then the initial temperature is zero degrees C. And this is equal to negative of the heat lost by the T. So the heat lost by the T is the mass of the T times the heat capacity of water times the final temperature minus the initial temperature, which was 90, and this is in degrees C. Okay, now the mass of the T is the same as the mass of ice, so we can actually just cancel everything off here. And what we're trying to do is find Tf. So we've got CWTF, and then we can move this one over, plus CWTF is equal to CW times 90 minus the latent heat of fusion. So we've got the final temperature is equal to 90 CW minus the latent heat of fusion over 2 CW. Substituting in, we end up with 5.17, and we said that was in degrees C because we substituted in 0 and 90, which were in degrees C. So that's the final temperature. So all the ice melts, and finally the T and the water, which was ice, are now in thermal equilibrium at 5.17 degrees. Now in part B, we said there was not enough energy contained within the T to melt all the ice. So the heat gained by the ice is only gained in the form MIL fusion in this case, and that's equal to the heat lost by the T, which is given by the mass of the T times the heat capacity of the T times the change in temperature of the T. And this time the initial temperature is 70 degrees C, so this is also in degrees C. Okay, so solving this for the mass of ice, this in this equation is referring to the mass of ice which is melted. So that's equal to 0.520 times 4180 times the final temperature, which we've said is 0 degrees C, as not all the ice is melted, so it's going to be in thermal equilibrium with the ice, so this is minus 70 and over the latent heat of fusion, which is 3.33 times 10 to the 5. Solving that on the calculator, we end up with 0 0.4569 kilograms. And so the ice remaining is equal to 520 minus, this is 470, sorry, 457 grams, which is equal to 63 of ice remain. Okay, problem three, and this is for 1131 only. So in this problem, we have an ice water bath here. This is the ice water, ice, and this is water. If they're in equilibrium, this suggests that this is at zero degrees C. And inside that we've got a piston which moves down from position one to position two, compressing the gas. Okay, so initially we push down from one to two quickly. As we're doing it quickly, there's no time for heat to flow. So when the piston goes from one to two, it suggests that's adiabatic. So we've got a PV diagram, which we're given. One to two quickly will be a compression, so the volume's decreasing. And so here's one, here's two. There's our adiabatic compression. 
it's then held steady, so it's then held at constant volume as heat flows into it. So constant volume, this is what we have here. And then it's slowly raised back up to position 1. So as it's raised back to position 1, that's done slowly, and so it suggests that that's isothermal. And this is adiabatic. So it's isothermal because as it's done slowly, it's always in equilibrium with its surroundings. And the question is, how much work has been done on the gas? We're told that for this entire process, 100 grams of ice melts. So this actually makes the question very easy. We've got from our first law of thermodynamics, the change in internal energy is equal to Q plus W. For a cycle, it ends up where it started. So the change in internal energy is zero. We can get the Q for the system from this 100 grams of ice that melts. So that suggests that Q, it, the energy gained by ice, is equal to the en negative energy lost by the gas. So the energy gained by the ice is the mass of the ice, 0 0.100 kilograms, times the latent heat of fusion of the ice, which is 3.33 times 10 to the 5. So doing that on the calculator, we end up with 33,300 and 300, so 33.3 kilojoules of heat. So 33.3 kilojoules is gained by the ice water mixture. That energy flows out from the gas. So the Q for the gas is minus 33.3 kilojoules. And so that tells us that the work done on the gas, which is where the gas is getting its energy from, is 33.3 kilojoules.